I'm Vanessa Berry and I'm speaking to you from Gadigal lands where I live and work. I'm going to read to you from my book Gentle and Fierce and I'm going to read the story The Fly which I wrote from my journals following the presences of flies through the years of my life. The Fly The fly fidgets bumping up against the window pane. As much as I try to ignore its buzz, the sound cuts into my attention. I turn to the window, which frames a view of an oak tree, a living photograph of pale green leaves. The fly jolts across it, seduced by the light, frustrated by the solid transparency of the glass. The sound of the fly opens up time. The buzz of its wings drills into my memory, the parts where the slightest, most incidental moments are stored. As I watch the fly hover at the glass, a moment from the past echoes. It is the late 1990s and I'm sitting on a narrow balcony, the roar of the nearby highway prickling the air around me as I read a slim blue book of Emily Dickinson's poetry. I am drawn to the same poem every time. I heard a fly buzz when I died. Its strangeness moves me and I read it like a secret, a communication from a ghost a reminder that life is momentary, is perpetual. The next year, on an afternoon when the air smells of flowers and mushrooms and damp heat, I walk to the bookstore where Elizabeth Jolly is speaking. At the back of the room, I sip water from a wine glass, watching people in the audience progressively shoo away a fly as it works its way around the room. I listen to Jolly's soft, clever voice. When she asks... How many of you are writing? I don't dare raise my hand. The fly has alighted on it, as if I've been chosen. The year after that, I'm sitting at a bus stop with my notebook open on my lap. The hot weather makes me notice things more acutely. I'm writing a list of the objects on the pavement in front of me. A purple artificial rose, a broken cassette cover, a recipe ripped out of a magazine, a fly approaching a puddle of melted ice cream. When someone sits down beside me, it's a friend with whom I exchange letters, but rarely see in person. He leans in close and says, don't write too seriously. Then the next year, I'm walking over the square of earth where the house I lived in as a teenager has been recently demolished. It had been a brick house, plain and small, with kitchen benches of bright yellow laminate. Already, though, it is difficult to clearly remember its details. I stand where my room had once been, listening to the sound of Saturday morning lawnmowers whining like flies. Like the vacant lot, I am waiting, an attentive, empty vessel. Then a year after that, I'm backstage at a music festival, sitting on a plastic folding chair outside one of the band's trailers. I can see them inside, huddled over a plate of drugs. The table behind them is covered in ravaged food. Strips of celery, broken breadsticks and squashed cheeses over which flies are creeping. Soon the band emerge, eyes blank, holding celery sticks. One by one they throw them towards the partition that separates their backstage area from those in the next tier of stardom, calling out, Morrissey, this is for you. The next year, at the acupuncture clinic, the practitioner flicks a pink tip needle into the skin under my belly button. There's a fly zigzagging over the window and I watch it to distract myself from my fear of the needle's sting. On the other side of the curtain, another acupuncturist explains to his patient that he's about to put a needle in the point for the liver, which is also the point for anger. I hear a yelp and then a man shouting, take it out. The fly buzzes with renewed energy, absorbing the man's rage. Acupuncture doesn't help me much. For the next year, I'm stuck back down in the underside of life. A fly, its body the same dark iridescent green as my fingernail polish, crawls over the pub table. No one moves to shoo it away. This crowd I'm spending my time with wake up late and drink all afternoon. When I feel a pull at my scalp, I see that the man beside me is biting my hair, his teeth sunk into the end of my long plait. I reach over to reclaim it, as if taking a toy from a baby. 
The following year I'm in the back garden of the house I've just moved into, watching the planes low overhead coming into land. Under the flight path, this close to the airport, the rent remains cheap. A United Airlines jet sends shivers through the aluminium skeleton of my chair, the roar of its engines filling my ears as it passes over, then quiet. Perched on the towel, hanging on the washing line, a fly turns in jerky movements like it is connected to puppet strings. Lizards dart across the fence, an ant surge in procession over the bricks. The next year I'm out walking on a long afternoon drift. Inside the ruin of the factory that once made tennis equipment, shreds of insulation hang down from the ceiling and the empty rooms have graffiti thick on the walls. Everything left behind has been broken. I sidestep a pile of smashed light bulbs and boxes of water-stained paper, then come to a sign for the laboratory. The entrance to it is choked by asthma weed and the buzz of flies comes from within. Fear bites me so sharply that I stop short and turn to check that no one is behind me. The year after that, I'm in an underground bar, listening to the performer on stage. It is Kristen Hirsch, who sings as if she's in a trance. Her songs are ghost stories, and I believe them, for I know that inside beauty, horror often lurks. A new song starts. I watch the image of the fly that is tattooed on the neck of the man beside me move in time with his pulse, in time with the music, in time with my own heart. The next year I'm teaching in a classroom with an odd parallelogram shape. Perhaps it is this skewed alignment that produces the weird mood that hangs over the students. One of them, who is particularly free in sharing her insecurities, says, I don't have ideas, I just can't come up with them, staring at me like this is a challenge. Before I can respond, another student, who hasn't said a word nor taken off his sunglasses all semester, goes to the window with the rolled up course reader and swats the fly that has been shuddering up and down the pane. I guess the first student continues. I just don't know why this class even exists. Then the year after that, I've moved house again and I'm unpacking boxes. The boxes once held eggs or cakes or oranges, but now they contain crockery wrapped in newspaper. As I unwrap the plates, I read snippets of last month's news. On one sheet is a crossword and I pause at the clue, flies partied, buzzing around waiting for the words to unlock to reveal the answer. But I stare and stare and just can't solve it. The next year, Simon and I approach the address where the dinner party is to be held. We're nervous because the house is larger and grander than we'd expected it to be. Inside, though, the walls have water stains and it smells of dust and cupboards and there's a fly in the pot of soup that is the main and only course. No one eats much anyway. We drink wine from water glasses and the loud, gets get, the loud guests get louder as the quiet ones retreat. I haven't said a word for half an hour. Through the dirty speckled glass of the window, the full moon watches us. The year after that, I fail my test to get my driver's licence, making nervous mistakes in my banal journey around the suburbs with the assessor. At home afterwards, I cry as if I might never stop. Later, when I go for a walk, I wear sunglasses to hide my puffy eyes. At the bakery, the school student who works the afternoons is standing in the entrance, holding a yellow plastic tennis racket. She swats at the air, at the tiny flies that are hovering around the door, determined to dispel them. She begrudgingly pauses to let me pass. The next year, I'm at the cliff above the ocean in Coogee, standing with a group of strangers. We are all watching dolphins in the middle of the bay, eyes fixed on the disturbance of water where their fins are visible above the surface. A woman walks up to me saying, where, where, as she brushes away a fly, which comes to buzz at my upper lip and prevents me from replying. Before I can direct her gaze, she cries out and grasps my hand tightly, her grip slim and hot and unfamiliar. Then the year after that, there are fires in the mountains and I listen to the reports of them on the radio. They announce the litany of road closures and the number of hectares burnt. The acrid air tastes of alarm and when I shut the kitchen window against the smoke, 
I noticed the flies trapped in the spiderweb in the corner of the frame. Behind them I see the sky is yellow with haze and the sun droops towards the horizon, smeared down the pane in a sickly red streak. The following year I'm sitting on the lawn behind the office where I spend my work days, watching a fly walk across the page in front of me, rubbing its front legs together as if the text is making it itchy. Underneath it are the words, a force in things which one had overlooked. The words make me itchy too, for I don't like to overlook things, but already my eyes have lifted up from the page. I'm distracted by the prickle of the sun on my arms as it warms the chill of office air conditioning from my skin, by the twitch of the blades of grass as ants move along beneath them, by the row of clouds like a string of commas. The year after, watching the traffic before stepping out onto the zebra crossing, I see that the crash will happen before it does. Then it comes, a wrench of metal, headlights bursting in a pop of glass and plastic. A man gets out from his smashed car to yell at the negligent driver. A crowd gathers to watch, but I don't join them. The accident makes me want to hide, and I retreat into the back lane, where flies hover over the bins, expired appliances are piled up, and the fences are painted with warnings. The year after this, I'm catching a taxi home from the hospice where Helen is in the final days of her life. Maybe I've seen her for the last time. As I left the room, I had to trust she could hear my goodbye in the deep place to which she had retreated. The taxi's radio is set to a jazz station, and every time the traffic lights stop us, the driver takes out a pocket notebook and writes in it. A fly is battering at the back window, just behind my head and I am as blank as an automaton. Then the next year I'm sitting in a sliver of shade underneath an oleander tree at the edge of a municipal rose garden. It's the exact middle of the week, the first hot day of the year. The phrase concrete and roses comes into my head and a fly zips past to underline the words in my thoughts. No one looks to be around, but there's a sense of things happening just out of sight. The more I concentrate, the closer I can get to them. The year after that, I'm standing in the doorway of a hotel room bathroom, watching Steph as she takes out a plastic fly from a packet. She turns to ask me, one fly or three? The hotel hush that encloses us is absolute as I consider her question. We might as well be in a bubble, floating 15 stories up over Tokyo. We had travelled from opposite sides of the world to be here together. One, I say, and she daubs eyelash glue on the shaved side of her head, waits a moment, then affixes the fly as if it has alighted there of its own accord. The following year I'm walking through the concrete corridor between the multi-storey car park and the back of the television station building on the path out from Central Station. Sometimes the city folds me into it, other times it pushes me away. Today I'm on the cusp like a fly walking on the rim of a glass. On the corner of the building is an electronic banner, a zipper of red text that broadcasts the news headlines. A warning moves across the screen. A heat pulse is due in the coming days. I am part of the crowd, walking towards the hot, parched future. The window shutters in its frame as I pull it up. A moment later, the fly finds the opening and soars out and away. For a brief moment, it is a speck against the trees. Then it is gone.